All right, now I'm going to get into the message. So we're continuing in our series in John, and, and tonight my, my whole goal is for us to, to know that I'm fully convinced of the gospel, right? I, I want you to, to believe that about yourself, that I am fully convinced of the gospel, but also I want you to be encouraged that you can still be convinced even if nobody else is. If you've been tracking along with us as we've been going through John, you'll see that Jesus has revealed himself in all kinds of different ways. So John's gospel specifically has seven signs, right? There's a, there's a unique aspect of that number seven, is wholeness, completion, and, and God made the world in six days, and on the seventh he rested, and, and, and there's seven signs that Jesus performs in the gospel of John. Now, John says if there's all of the signs that were written down, it, it wouldn't even fill up all the books in the world. There's so many that Jesus did, but he wrote these seven and these things that we're reading so that we would believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So these seven signs that Jesus is doing are all pointing to the fact that he is the Messiah. He's turned water into wine. He's walked on water. He's fed the multitude with five loaves and two fish. He's healed people on the Sabbath day. He's done all these things. Why? So that we could know that he is the Messiah. Not only has he demonstrated the gospel and the compassion of the Father, but he's also proclaimed it. He said some radical things, things like me and the Father are one. He said things like all life belongs to me and I give it to whoever I want. I am the bread of life. He says, my words are God's words. He says that I have everlasting water, that if you're thirsty, just come to me and you'll drink. And he also says that I will send the Holy Spirit to live inside of those who believe in me. So he's proclaimed and he's demonstrated the good news. And so, so as he's doing this, by the way, this is our mission, right? We are, as the church, supposed to carry on the work of Christ. He calls us the body of Christ. What does that mean? We are the physical representation of Jesus Christ on the earth. If the world is going to see Christ, they're going to see Christ through us, his body. So what do we do? We continue his work of proclaiming and demonstrating the good news of the kingdom. He started the work. We are supposed to finish it with him in partnership with God. When Christ gave us the Great Commission, this was not a suggestion, he didn't say, hey, if you feel like it, if you feel really called, if you're super spiritual, then you can go ahead and fulfill the Great Commission and make disciples. No, he says, all of us are supposed to do this. And when he sent his Holy Spirit to live inside the church, it wasn't so that we could feel really good about ourselves and have goosebumps during a worship service or do magic tricks. The Holy Spirit, what does he say in Acts 1 and 8? I will give you power from on high when the Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses. So the purpose of him giving the Holy Spirit is to empower the church so that we would be his witnesses in the world. So Christ, he does this. He proclaims the good news of the kingdom, but then he demonstrates it, and that's what we're supposed to do. It's not just the proclamation. We do need to do that. It's also the demonstration, which you'll notice is there's a lot of camps that kind of, you know, in, in different churches, some will be all about just the proclamation, but they don't do anything to to, to ease the ails of uh, th those who are hurting, those who are oppressed, those who are experiencing injustice or poverty. They don't do anything. They don't demonstrate. It's just all about the proclamation. And then on the other side, there's the different camps of Christianity and the church where they're all about social justice and, and demonstrating the kingdom, but they don't want to proclaim it because it's, it's offensive to our society. Jesus did both. He shared the heart and the love of the Father in tangible ways, but he also proclaimed it. He proclaimed the good news, and we're supposed to continue that. So I'm, I'm going to keep beating this drum. You're like, oh, my gosh, every single week, Sean's talking about being on mission. Of course, we're going to do that every week. Until when? Uh, until you do it. Until we do it. And, and then once we're all doing it, I'm going to keep doing it until our mission is complete. The mission has not been completed. Right? We're, we're close. We're closer than any other time in history to see all nations have a worshiping remnant in them. He says this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all nations as a testimony to me. Then the end will come. The whole purpose is so that the church will preach the gospel to all nations. And, and we're close. And I have the hope that my, my children or maybe their grandchildren will see the fulfillment of the Great Commission. So we are supposed to live on mission. And what does this mean? This means you need to lay down your life. For the sake of the world. Lay down your life for the sake of the world. You do not exist for yourself. You exist for the one who bought you with his own blood. You exist for him. You lay down your life for the sake of the world. Why? Because that's what Christ did, and he calls us to follow in his footsteps. So what does that mean? That, that means you need to pour your life out. You need to give and to love, and, and even if they hate you for doing it, 
even if the world hates you for doing it. And, and that's the, the tragic part is the world will hate you for doing it. As we're going to see in our passage tonight, not everyone is going to accept the message of Jesus Christ. Not everyone's going to accept the message or the ministry of Christ. And we're going to see four responses to the gospel. So as Christ is proclaiming and demonstrating the good news of the kingdom, there, people respond in all kinds of different ways. And in this passage, in this story, we're going to see four and what's interesting is as I went out evangelizing yesterday, uh, I, I talked to eight different people that were actually memorable. We talked to more, handed out a few more gospel tracts, but the eight meaningful conversations, every single one of them fit within one of these four responses. There were those who were convinced. They, they believed Jesus is Messiah. Uh, there were those who were confused. Like, I don't know, this doesn't really make sense. There were those who were opposed. I get what you're saying. I don't want anything to do with it. And then there were those who were conflicted, like they're, they're just on the fence. They're not confused. They, they see that they probably should be opposed to, to Jesus as opposed to like what the, the world is saying, like we should be opposed, but there's something drawing them and they were conflicted, kind of on the fence. So there was those who were convinced, those who are confused, those who are opposed, and those who are conflicted. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to John chapter 7. John chapter 7, and let's all stand for the reading of God's word. Our key text is going to be in John 7, 40 through 53, but I'm going to start in verse 37. This is what we read last week, and, and this is uh, really important, and it's the context kind of that sets up the, the text for tonight. So John chapter 7, starting in verse 37. On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and he cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. He said this about the Spirit. Those who believed in Jesus were going to receive the Spirit. For the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now our key text in verse 40. When some from the crowd heard these words, they said, this truly is the prophet. Others said, this is the Messiah. But some said, surely the Messiah doesn't come from Galilee, does he? Doesn't the scripture say that the Messiah comes from David's offspring and from the town of Bethlehem where David lived? So the crowd was divided because of him. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. Verse 45 then the servants came to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him? And the servants answered, no man has ever spoke like this. Then the Pharisees responded to them, are you fooled too? Have the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd which doesn't know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, the one who came to him previously and who was one of them, said to them, our law doesn't judge a man before it hears from him and knows what he's doing, does it? You aren't from Galilee too, are you? They replied. Investigate, and you'll see that no prophet comes from Galilee. Then each went to his own house. Amen. You may be seated. So you can kind of see them in this text, right? Jesus is proclaiming, and if anybody's thirsty, come to me and let him drink. They're going to have rivers flowing from deep within them. And, and then there's this response. God is literally reconciling a sinful world to himself. And people are conflicted. People are, they have differing responses. And tonight we're looking at four of those. And so we're starting with the first response, which is the convinced. The convinced. Now, this is who we want to be. Right? In fact, you guys are still here. Talk to me. Say, I am convinced. There you go. That's, that's not hard, right? I am convinced. So John 7, 40 through 41, he says, someone from the crowd heard these words and they said, truly, this is the prophet. Others said, he's the Messiah. They were convinced that what Jesus was saying was true. So what specifically were they convinced about? This is what we have to ask ourselves. And this is really per important as it comes to evangelism because a lot of times we have our different Christian camps and our doctrines that we want people to really understand. But what did these people understand about Jesus. What were they convinced of? It wasn't the exact right theological doctrines, right? It's easy, again, to get caught up in our theological camps. You know, one time, for example, uh, I, I went to, to India and I spoke with a church planter who, um, who, who had planted 50 different churches in unreached 
areas. And so unreached meaning they have never heard the name of Jesus, or maybe they've heard about Jesus among the pantheon, but they have no real understanding, cultural context of who Jesus was. And this particular pastor, I sat down and had a conversation with him. Me and Bishop Coleman, we met with him, and we're just asking him questions. And this church wasn't huge. His church was a house church. He had his house, and then they had like a little chapel area where they could fit about, you know, 30 to 50 people. Um, But there was 50 of these kinds of churches in unreached people groups. I'm like, how does this one man preach in such a hard setting. And, and I, I asked him, I said, hey, man, in America, I'm talking through a translator. I said, in America, we have all these different denominations and we have these different theological, like Christians divide over theology, over doctrine. And he's kind of looking at me like puzzled and sideways. And I was like, like, for example, you know, Calvinism versus Arminianism or, or uh, egalitarianism versus complementarianism. Some of you guys are like, what the heck is that? If you don't know, don't worry. You're not missing much. Um, but he's looking at me and he's like, I, I don't understand. He's like, I, I preach Christ and him crucified and people fall in love with Jesus and they get baptized even to their own peril because it's illegal to baptize or to con- convert uh, someone from Hinduism. And so the the point that I got was like, we get so, in in the Western world, we get so caught up in the particular distinct theological position, whereas what did these people believe? They believed that Jesus was the Messiah. That was it. They didn't have it all figured out. They just knew that whoever this Jesus guy is, he's it. So so what am I saying? Am I I saying that theology and doctrine isn't important? No, no, absolutely not. I, I am a theology nerd. I love theology. I love doctrine. Of course, doctrine is important. The other aspects of Christ are important, right? We need to know who Jesus is. And in one of our earlier gatherings at Ecclesia, when we were doing our midweek gatherings, I made a distinction uh, between essential Christian doctrine, critical Christian doctrines, important and interesting, Right, so, so we, we, the, the message was called Sound Doctrine, and uh, the point was that there are some doctrines, some teachings about Christ that are essential, like you have to believe this about Jesus to be saved. And other doctrines are so important, I, I call them critical, like if, if you're wrong about this, this could have catastrophic effects of your belief of even essential doctrines. And then there's those doctrines that are important, things like Calvinism versus Arminianism, things like women's roles in leadership and not, and and those are are very important. They have implications for how we function and operate in the life of the church. But then there's just other doctrines that are just interesting. Like we could geek out and talk about these finer theological points. They have no bearing on how you live out your faith, right? This is like, how is it all going to end? Or or what they call eschatology, your, your end time belief, your belief about how to interpret Revelation and how the end is the Antichrist, you know, did he already come? Is he coming? Those are interesting, but they're not essential. They're not critical. So these believers in our story, they were convinced of what? That Jesus was the prophet who was foretold. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah that was promised. They didn't understand all that that meant for them. You have to put your shoes, yourself in the shoes of these first century believers who are like, I don't understand. They, they have this cultural understanding of who the Messiah and the prophet ought to be. And they're like, I don't have this all figured out, but I believe that he's it. Whatever he says is right. Listen to this. In Romans 10, 8 through 13, it says, The message is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. Since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This, in Romans 10, is what we call the simple gospel message. Again, it doesn't mean that these other theological points aren't important, but what are we trying to get people to believe? We're trying to help them to confess Jesus Christ as Lord. So these people in your fill-ins, they were convinced that Jesus was the Messiah. And, And here's the thing. Once you respond positively to the reality of who God has revealed himself to be, once you have responded positively to Jesus as Lord, you are continually drawn into the light. 
That means when, when I gave my life to God, I did not have all of the, the, the perfect theology I have today. No, I'm just kidding. I just not perfect. I'm probably wrong on some things. Uh, but but at, at least I have it a little bit more figured out than like day one, right? Day one, I knew nothing. I knew nothing. All I knew that is if I were to stand before this God that this preacher was telling me, I would be condemned and he would be good in condemning me. And he told me that this Jesus died on a cross in my place. So he'll treat me as if I lived his life. I believe that. And he's, what do I need to do? He says, just believe it. Come to me in faith. And if you come to him in faith, you're going to repent from your sins. Like that was the basics that I had. That, that was it. Just Jesus died. He rose from the grave. Put your faith in him. True faith means turning from the stuff that sent him to the cross. That was it. I didn't have anything else figured out. When I was telling other people about my excitement of my newfound faith, I'm pretty sure I was wrong about a lot of things. I didn't articulate it correctly, but I had this simple gospel message that Jesus is Messiah. And, and what is interesting is that as, they, as you respond to the Lord positively, he starts to open up more and more truth and, and light and revelation to you. And what I love about these people who were convinced that Jesus was Messiah was they, they were not moved by people who were opposed. They were convinced, and they knew that other people were not convinced, that they were opposed, and they didn't let those people influence their decision to confess Jesus Christ. They had already seen multitudes turn away from him. The previous chapter, 5,000 people were fed, and they all left him because the message was too hard. They saw all of that. They're like, okay, the crowd has left him, They've seen his own brothers reject him in the beginning of this chapter. His brothers are even trying to put him to the test, and his brothers are rejecting him. And now they're seeing the Pharisees and the leaders, all the religious people who are the, those that are in power, are opposing him, wanting even to kill him, and they didn't care about any of that. None of that moved them from confessing Jesus as Messiah before the world. It says in verse 40, they said, they professed it out loud, he's the prophet. Verse 41, others said, he's the Messiah. They were convinced. The second group we see here are those who are confused. Confused. Now, the confused people weren't like the convinced who didn't have all the answers, right? Both groups, the convinced ones and the confused ones, did not have it all together. They did not have all of the answers. Here's the primary difference, and it's in your fill-in. The confused ones thought they already had the answers, why were they confused? Because they thought they had the answers. And, and because Jesus wasn't matching with who they determined in their own mind he ought to be. They thought they had all the answers. Jesus did not fit the box that they tried to put him in in their mind, and so they were confused. John 7, 41 through 43, others said, this is the Messiah. But some said, surely the Messiah doesn't come from Galilee, does he? Like, I know in my mind, whenever the Messiah comes, he ain't coming from Galilee. Doesn't the scripture say that the Messiah comes from David's offspring, from the town of Bethlehem, where David lived? Now, we know the Christmas story. They don't understand that whole context, but they had all of the answers in their, in their mind, and so the crowd was divided because of him. The confused ones had just as many unanswered questions as the convinced ones. But what, what did they do? They relied too much on their own intellect and they, they relied too much on their own reasoning. It prohibited them from seeing Christ for how he presented himself. They had God figured out. I meet a lot of people like this that they, they're prohibited, they're hindered from coming to Christ the way he has revealed himself because they've already painted a picture in their mind of who God ought to be, of who Christ ought to be. And so now when we preach the, the scriptures, we preach Christ crucified, rose on the third day, that you need to put your faith and repent, put your faith in him and repent from your sins. They, they, they can't figure it out. Why? Because they have their minds made up already. Their presuppositions presented them, uh, uh, prevented them from seeing Christ. And what's funny is they're, they're using the same arguments as the Pharisees. That, like, You're from, are you from Galilee too? Investigate. No prophet comes from Galilee. It's this place about Galilee. Like Nobody wanted to have the, the, the hero, the Messiah, come from Galilee. That's like, man, is he from Sanger? No, sorry, if you're from Sanger. Belief in Christ uh, does not defy logic, right? So, so I'm not saying that it defies logic, but belief in Christ does go beyond logic. 
What I mean by that is you're not going to logic your way into the kingdom. You're not going to have all of your answers figured out and, and all, like, I've figured this whole thing out by my reason and by my logic. Why? Because 1 Corinthians 1 tells us in verse 20, where is the one who is wise? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the debater of this age? Hasn't God made the world's wisdom foolish? For since in God's wisdom, the world didn't know God through wisdom. God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of what is preached. For the Jews asked for signs. The Greeks seek wisdom. But what do we do? We preach Christ crucified. It's a stumbling block for Jews. It's foolishness to, to the Gentiles. Yet to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. You're not going to logic your way into the kingdom. They thought that they could come to God by their own reasoning and they were confused. Why? Because they painted a picture of who God ought to be and who God actually was did not line up with what they wanted. I, I was raised up in a certain faith tradition, right? And, and it, my belief about God was... You know, he's a heavenly father. He died for sins. You know, so he took care of that sin problem. So I, if I just mentally acknowledge those historic facts, I got that hell thing taken care of. And I could live in heaven for eternity, whatever that means. I, I had wrong thoughts about God. And, you know, for those of you who met Bishop Coleman last week, he, he didn't hold back in preaching the truth with conviction when he preached the gospel and I responded to it, he painted a completely different picture of God. I didn't understand it. I didn't have all of my questions answered, but I knew that the God he's preaching, that's, that's the Lord. It went against everything I thought I knew about God, but the word was so compelling I had to sacrifice my misconceptions and move from confused to convinced, even if I didn't have all of my questions answered. So here's the thing. Being convinced doesn't require you to have it all figured out. Being fully convinced requires you to refuse to remain confused about who Jesus is and say yes to Jesus, whatever that means for your life. That's what being convinced means. Like, I am not going to be confused about who Jesus has revealed himself to be. I'm not going to make excuses for not following him because he's not lining up with the picture of God I painted in my own mind. You see Christ exactly how he intended himself to be revealed, and you welcome him as your Lord and Savior. So there was the convinced, and then there were the confused. And this third group is the opposed, the opposed. Some of them, they weren't just unwilling to confess Christ as Messiah. Some of them were violently opposed to him. What's interesting, I don't know if you guys have ever met these people who are like vehemently against God. They're atheists. I don't believe in God and I hate him. So how are you going to hate someone you don't believe in, first off, right? I don't know if you've ever met those people, but they're ex they exist. They're out there. I don't believe in God and I'm mad at him. I don't believe in God and, and I, I hate him. So here, here's the thing. America is what... what I believe, is a post-Christian nation. I, I shared this at the evangelism seminar. I want to share some, some interesting facts about the context that we're living in, all right? So the Declaration of Independence, right? That's, we're, we're going to be celebrating Independence Day. It's incredible, right? We have freedom. That was signed in 1776. Now, at that time, in the entire population of the U.S., there was roughly 2.5 million people in the entire country. That, that's about half the size of L.A., so, so half the size of L.A. was the entire United States, all right? And, and all of those, the, the Declaration of uh, Independence was written by the 13 colonies of the U.S., which were British settlements. Most of them were Christian. There, this was a heavy Christian influence. Uh, so so what, what, what am I saying? At the time of the writing of the Declaration of Independence, Christianity was the assumed worldview. Like, this is just fact. Everybody believes this, right? And it's only two and a half million people in the entire country. Everybody just kind of assumed it. Now, here's the thing. Today, in America, we have nearly 332 million people. Not 2.5, 332 million. And all of those people are coming from all over the world. And all of them are adding to American culture with their different religious backgrounds and their different cultural backgrounds. And so we are diverse in every way through art 
education, media, and religion. And because of that diversity, there's also diversity in how we see the world. So Christianity is no longer just the assumed worldview. When you go out to people on the streets, we have this history. It's kind of weird because we have this history of Christianity to where people still kind of assume, like, oh, of course, this is a sacred holy book, and they know about the name of Jesus, but they don't assume that that's correct or that's true. Who am I to say that every other religion is false, right? You know, so, so when you go out and talk to people, it's just this weird, eclectic mix of Christian historic origins with all of this other influence to where nobody really just assumes that the Bible is true. And so we, we've replaced a Christian worldview with things like secularism or nationalism. And so we're ministering to people who live in a culture that used to be Christian. And so now people, you'll, you'll notice if you go evangelizing with this, people are naturally skeptical about the truth. So you'll, you'll preach from the word of God, from the Bible. And they're like, well, why should I listen to that book? Right? They're, they're kind of skeptical about Christianity. So what does this mean when we talk about Jesus? It's similar to when uh, I visited India, right? In India, the, the national religion is Hinduism. But they have this freedom of religious act, right? Freedom of religion act. So, but what that really means in India is that you're free to be your little Christian thing and, and meet in your little Christian churches. But if you baptize someone, you could go to prison, Right? If, you, if you live out your Christian faith the way the Bible tells us to, nobody wants that. So they have freedom of religion on paper, but in practice, they, they really don't. So how does that affect how we're talking about the gospel in our context? It's the same kind of thing. People want you to be a Christian. You're, you have a freedom of religion. Do your thing in ecclesia in your own little building. But when your faith actually influences your life, and your ethics, and which is going to ultimately affect the way you vote and talk about important political issues, they will violently oppose you. In the same way they oppose Jesus. This did not line up with their political affiliation, with the, the, the thing that they had going on, with their understanding of who the Messiah ought to be and what the Messiah ought to do for them which was to release them from Roman captivity, right? To come in as this general, the soldiers, like that's clearly not it. He comes from Galilee, he's kind of meek, like he, he's not fighting anybody. So they're violently opposed to him. And it's the same things that we, we see today. They use tactics of shame, they use tactics of influence, they use tactics of power. None of this is new. In our passage, John 7, 47, it says some of them wanted to seize them, seize him, but nobody laid hands on him. Verse 45, then the servants came to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him? The servants answered, no man ever spoke like this. Here's the shame. The Pharisees responded, are you fooled too? What are you, an idiot? Are you stupid? Have any of the rulers or Pharisees believed in him that, that they're, they're appealing to popularity? But this crowd, which doesn't know the law is a curse, you're uneducated, you're stupid, nobody in power believes this stuff, they're going to shame you. But this crowd, which doesn't know the law, they're accursed. And Nicodemus, the one who came to him previously and was one of them, said, our law doesn't judge a man before he hears from him and, and knows what he's doing, does it? And, and so Nicodemus isn't even saying, I'm for him. He's just saying, like, hey, we shouldn't be so like, hard against this Jesus guy. And what do they say? What are you from Galilee too? Shame. They replied, investigate. No, nobody comes from Galilee. No prophet comes from Galilee. Not only did they reject the truth from themselves, but they wanted to silence the truth. Right? So, so we're going to have that in our culture. People that are not, they say they're okay with you practicing your religion. But when you actually go to live that out, they will be opposed to you. Just like they were to Jesus. They didn't want to believe the truth, but they also did not want anybody else to actually live this thing out and believe in it either. They tried to get others to join in their rebellion. They used things like shame and power and status. Are you fooled? Have any of the, the Pharisees believed this? Are you from Galilee? They look for validation by popular opinion. And so, church, we, we have to rep, remember the words of Jesus. And we're going to get to this in several weeks, but I'm going to say it right now. John 15, 18 through 20. If the world hates you, understand that it hated me first. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you are not of this world, but I've chosen you out of it, the world hates you. But remember the word I spoke to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll also keep your word. Here's your fill-in. The world will oppose the gospel of Jesus 
but we must remain faithful. It's not popular, right? All of the talking points, when you actually live this thing out, the world is crying out for answers. Whether they believe it or not, whether they think they're crying out for answers, the world is lost and confused, walking in darkness as the blind leads the blind. And the church is the beacon of light and hope. We are the pillar and foundation of truth. And what do we do? We're silent because we don't want to offend anybody. That's like looking at somebody drowning and saying, well, I don't really want to like throw out the lifesaver because it might hit them in the head and you know, it might offend them. Like, I'm just assuming that they don't know how to swim. They're dying. They're, they're drowning, and we don't want to offend them. The world is going to oppose the gospel, but what do we do? We pour out. We love them, even if they hate us for doing it. We must remain faithful. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good. Why does Paul tell us, don't, don't become weary in doing good? For at the proper time, you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. Why does he tell us this? Because you will be tempted to grow weary. I'm tired. I don't want to die on this path. Every time I'm around these people and and they're just attacking my worldview and I feel like it's a fight, it's an argument. He says, don't be weary in well-doing. And now I'm not saying be a jerk and be obnoxious, right? The gospel is offensive enough. You don't have to add offense with you just being an idiot to people, right? Like, hey, I know where this person is. I'm going to trigger them by this Christian cliche. Like, you're, you're supposed to love and not add offense to the gospel, but you also should not cower away from these conversations. And I think for the most part, you know, the, the people that are going to be loud and obnoxious, they're, they're there. I think for the most part, the church is silent when we should be speaking up. This city is crying out for answers, and the church should no longer hide them from within our four walls. This is safe. I can talk to you about whatever I want. Let us go out there and tell them the truth. So there were the convinced, there were the confused, there were the opposed, and this last group is the conflicted. The conflicted. Now, I have hope for the conflicted, right? I love hanging out with people that are conflicted because it's almost like they're going to come around eventually. It's just a matter of time. They're like on the fence and like, all right, I I love hanging out with those people who are conflicted. Who are they? John 7, 45 through 46. The servants came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him? Right, so the servants were sent by the Pharisees to go ahead and seize Jesus. But the servants, they go to Jesus and they hear him and they're like, I'm not touching that. Like, I'm not supposed to seize him. And they come back and the Pharisees are like, where is he at? Why didn't you seize him? And they said, no man ever spoke like this. They were supposed to be opposed to Christ, but they couldn't find it within themselves to seize him. Here's the thing. They weren't fully convinced But they weren't blatantly opposed either. They couldn't bring themselves to defy Christ, even though all reason and pressure was on them to do so. It made logical sense. Look at all these people saying where the Messiah is supposed to be from and what he's supposed to do. And all of the pressure on me from the Pharisees. Like, I'm a servant of the Pharisees. They're telling me to be opposed to this guy. And I'm just, I I can't do it. They couldn't bring themselves to defy Christ. And it's the same thing with Nicodemus. It's, it's cool because Nicodemus was the one in John 3 who saw Jesus at night and he had him at his house. And he's like, tell me about yourself. We know that you're from the Lord, but why? Where, where, how are you getting these things? And, and Jesus talks to him about being born again, right? Nobody can see the kingdom unless they're born again. And so Nicodemus, he, he's already had this interaction. He's had this dinner with Jesus And he's like one of the Pharisees who's supposed to be opposed. He's like, me and my group are opposed to Christ. But he's like, I can't bring myself to do it. In verse 50, he says, the one who came, Nicodemus, the one who came to him previously and who was one of them, said to them, our law doesn't judge a man before it hears from him and knows what he's doing, does it? And they they got on his case for that. You're not from Galilee too, are you? Investigate. You'll see that no prophet arises from Galilee. So, so the conflicted people are the ones who God is clearly drawing them. God is drawing them. He's working on them, and, and they're, sh- they're showing signs of being compelled by the person of Christ. But guess what? In the same way that God is drawing them, we also have an enemy who is alive and active, and he's going to do everything he can to try to get them from going all in for Jesus. He's going to try harder for them to be hindered from coming to the person of Christ. And, and how does he do that? We've already seen his tactics. Shame, social ostracism, intellectual bullying. The conflicted don't care so much about those social pressures, though. They're after the truth. 
They're after the truth. And so when we know our conflicted friends and family, those people that we're in relationship with them, we need to be praying for them because in the same way that God is drawing them, the enemy is going to be trying to attack them as well. I don't know about you, but when I first came to the Lord, it was like a struggle every Sunday to come to church. Like something would always happen. Some roadblock or some hindrance was going to get in the way or me and Candace would get in a fight because, you know, it's me and Candace. You know, she's God's still working on her. I had all my issues taken care of in one day. And she, no, like, we're, we're, you know, something would happen. It's like, I don't even want to go to church now. Right? So something would always happen. Try to, and what is that? That's the enemy. That's the enemy. Why? Because I was conflicted, right? This is even, be, even before I came to Christ. I remember Candace was praying for me. And it was always something that got in the way of me hearing the gospel. And when I heard it and I understood it, it was very evident why the enemy did not want me to come to church. So the, the, the conflict in this story, they don't care so much about the social pressures. They're after the truth. In, in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4, it says, If our gospel is veiled, like cover, you know, veils covering your face, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case... The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Like there is spiritual warfare happening. When you share Christ, when you're proclaiming and demonstrating Christ, whether that's on the streets or in the context of your own relationships, the enemy is going to veil and blind the minds of unbelievers to prevent them from seeing the light of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And so there is spirit. It's not just intellectual warfare. This is spiritual warfare. Now, here, here's the thing. Though I love and I have hope for those who are conflicted, I also fear for them. I also fear for them because it's not like they're opposed, but they're also not all in either. They're kind of in this middle ground. They're like, I'm not opposed. I'm coming around. But they, they also know that they haven't been living all in. They're, they're not something holding them back from going all in. And that's scary. Because we could convince ourselves that our non-decision is somehow virtuous before God. Here's the thing. Your non-decision is a decision to not go all in. That is a decision to not be all in for Christ. If you're saying, well, I'm not opposed to him, that's not virtuous in itself. Your non-decision to go all in is a decision to not be all in for Christ. It would be like me going to your house and knocking on your door, and you're like checking the ring or peeking through the blinds, and you're like, oh, it's Sean. Well, I'm not telling him to go away. But I'm also not going to answer the door and invite him into my house. And it's like, hey, thank you so much for not turning me away from your door. It's like, no, like your decision to not open the door and let me in is a decision to not let me into your house. A lot of people who are professing Christians are coming into the church, but they're keeping Jesus on the porch of their life. They're not letting him all the way in. And we're convincing ourselves that this is virtuous because I'm not opposed to him. I'm coming around. I'm saying the right things. But I'm not all in. And, and what does Revelation 3.20 says? See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in with him and eat with him and he with me. He doesn't expect to knock on the door and you to just kind of keep it closed. He wants you to open it up. And it's okay to have some conflict with Jesus. You know, I, I'm, I met it yesterday. People going through some real stuff. And I see why people are conflicted with where Jesus stands in their life. It's okay to have conflict, but it's not okay to stay there. It's not okay to stay there. God doesn't want you to stay conflicted. God has grace for those who struggle. He does. He understands. He's been tempted in every single way, yet he is without sin. But at some point, you, you need to make a decision. And, and I know all of you guys have somebody in your life like that. Maybe it's you. Maybe you're the conflicted. Maybe you like... I come around, I'm not opposed, I'm open, but I haven't been all in for whatever reason. When we stand before God, none of the excuses that are holding us back are going to have any kind of weight. 
He's going to say, I gave you the option. I showed you my beauty. I showed you my grace. I showed you my love. I showed you my character. And you just kept me on the front porch. He's calling you to be all in. Here's the thing. We're, we're not promised a tomorrow. The, the day I gave my life to the Lord, it was a scary thing because I knew that if I were to leave that place, I knew the decision I had to make. And if I didn't make a decision and something, I got hit by a bus or something, you know, whatever, I'm not trying to scare people into making some decision, but I'm just saying the reality is we're not promised a tomorrow. And so we can't keep Jesus on the porch. Someone who's conflicted might think they're, they're doing the, this honorable thing, but no, the, G, Jesus doesn't see that as a virtue. He understands, he empathizes, but he's calling you to go all in. He doesn't simply want your tolerance, right? A lot of people tolerate, tolerate God, but they say tolerance is the virtue of a man without convictions. He doesn't want us to tolerate. Jesus wants us to be all in, and that's your last fill-in. So as I'm wrapping up, a couple takeaways Not everyone's going to accept the gospel. Not everyone's going to accept the gospel. Um, we can't make anybody believe. You can't make anybody be a follower of Christ. Why? Because if Jesus couldn't, you can't. He's presenting, he's proclaiming and demonstrating the gospel, and we see four different responses. Not all of them were convinced. Some were. Some were conflicted. Some were confused. Some were violently opposed and so if that happens to Jesus we have to understand that as we are being a witness for Christ not everybody's going to accept him but we have to know that we have accepted him fully that you are all in that you are fully convinced of the gospel you don't have to have all the answers but you do have to say yes to Jesus and so what does this require for you to be all in for you to be convinced this requires you to be open you need to be open to the gospel you need to be humble don't try to think you have it all figured out. You need to humble yourself and approach the word of God. Not, I'm standing over to see if this, uh, if this aligns with how I want it to read. You come underneath the authority of the word of God. The word of God stands in authority over you and you come to it with a humble heart saying, whatever you say is true. You also have to have courage because people will oppose the gospel. The world is opposed. The world does not want Christ and they don't want you to want Christ either. So it does take courage, and courage isn't the absence of fear, it is the overcoming of fear. So it's recognizing, this is kind of a scary thing, like Jesus is calling me to be all in, and I know what this might cost me and require of me, but I am going to overcome that, why? Because he overcame for me. It also takes surrender. Yesterday, I was, I was talking with a guy. He, he's living in a, a homeless encampment from Bakersfield, came over here. He'd been drinking every single day for over a year and a half. He's trying to get his life together. He said, I stopped drinking about a month ago. And this is insane because I just quit cold turkey after drinking every single day for a year and a half. And I'm trying to get my life together. And he's living in a homeless encampment. And, and I told him, I said, look, man, I know some different resources that can help you get on your feet. But it's going to require you to put in the effort, to put in the work. I talked to him about the academy. I talked to him about these different resources, but it's not going to be easy. And uh, every single person I talk to on the streets that, like, I tell them about the academy, I tell them about these programs, they go, oh, I don't know, 18 months. I'm like, how long did it take you to screw your life up? It took you longer than 18 months. You think you're going to get it figured out in a week? What's another 18 months to get your life on track? What does that take? It takes surrender. You need to surrender your own thoughts and your own desires, your own plans that you have for your life and say, God, whatever you want, even if that means following you into the hard place, even if that means surrendering all of these plans that I had for my life and all of these things that I wanted to do, I'll surrender all of that. And it also takes conviction. You need to be convicted that Christ is the Messiah. He is who he says he is and he's worth giving everything up for. So Trevor's going to lead us in a worship song, and, and we're going to uh, enter into a time of prayer. In fact, I want us all to stand together. As he's worshiping, I want us to, to go into a time of prayer for one another. And so this looks like awkward, maybe, for some of you who aren't used to this. But if there's someone next to you, just put your hand on their shoulder. Or just say, hey, what can I pray for you about? And then pray for that thing. And then when you're done, what can I pray for you about? And pray for that thing. Let's pray for one another. Amen.